welcome to this first of a series of introductory screencasts to Grails, the rapid web application development framework for the Java platform. Grails is an all-in-one solution that, once you install it, provides everything you need to get going. As you can see from this diagram, Grails is tightly bound to the Java ecosystem. In particular, it builds on two giants of the Java world. Spring provides a flexible and powerful application model, and Hibernate is an efficient and powerful solution to mapping Java objects to database tables. Grails glues together all these libraries and frameworks and makes them more accessible and simpler to use. In particular, it does this through the dynamic language Groovy, which has a Java-like syntax, but is much more expressive. Throughout this series of screencasts, we'll be building a sample application based on something called the Pomodoro technique. This is a way of getting things done. In the early stages, this is basically going to boil down to a to-do list. So with that in mind, here's the domain model. It's very straightforward. We'll have a set of tasks and some tags. And each task may have multiple tags, and each tag may be applied to multiple tasks. In other words, we have a classic many-to-many -many relationship. Now we're ready to get started developing our application. In this series of screencasts, I'm going to use SpringSource Tool Suite, or STS, to develop the application. You can also download and install the Grails framework independently and use it from the command line. Instructions for doing this are given on this web page. Now let's go to STS. The first thing you'll have to do is install the Groovy and Grail support. So from the dashboard, select the Extensions tab, and from there, select the Grails current production release, Grails support, and the Groovy Eclipse plugin. And finally, click on Install. Once STS has restarted, you're ready to create your first Grails application. Start by switching to the Grails perspective and then create a new Grails project. I'll call this one Pomodoro App. That will start the Grails Create App command, which will create the initial project for us. Next, we create our first domain class. We'll put this in a package, org.example.pomodoro, and this will be the task domain class. Domain class properties represent our persistent data. So a task has a summary, which is text, details, which is also text, the date when it was created, a deadline, which is a date again, and time spent. Since a task, when it's first created, can't have had any time spent on it, I can set its initial value to zero. I can also declare what constitute valid values for these properties in the constraints block. The syntax for constraints is quite simple. You start with the name of the property, followed by a constraint name, colon, and then the value for that constraint. You can have multiple constraints separated by commas. For task, neither summary nor details can be blank, and I've decided that the summary should be unique. Not all tasks will have a deadline, so I want to make that property optional. I do that by making it nullable true. For domain classes, the default is nullable false, therefore all properties are required. And for time spent, I specify the minimum value. There are a few things to note about this class. First, for non-Java developers, the naming conventions are such that types, including class names, start with a capital letter and properties start with a lowercase letter. In both, the rest of the name is camel case. And second, the properties that you want to persist must have an explicit type, because that's how Grails knows how to store them in a database. Now for the tag domain class. This will go in the same package as task.
tag is nice and simple. It has a string property name that cannot be blank and must be unique. I also want to be able to associate a tag with multiple tasks. This is easy in Grails. I simply have to add a static has many property. In this case, I'm going to add a collection property called tasks that contains domain instances of type task. I also want to be able to access tags from a task. So it's back to the task domain class we go. This time we have many tags of type tag. Our domain model is now ready, so let's create a basic user interface for it. We start by creating a controller for task. Note that we specify the same package and class name as we used for the domain class. As you can see, the name of the actual class created has a controller suffix. This suffix is a Grails convention. Generating a basic CRUD UI for our task domain class takes just one line. If we also want to create, modify and delete tags, we have to create a scaffolded controller for that domain class too. Note that because the controller is named after the domain class, we could also use a value of true for the scaffold property. We're now ready to start our simple web application via the Grails run app command. In this case, the server will start up with an error. As we can see, it says no owner defined between domain classes, tag and task. And then it tells us that we have to add a belongs to. So let's do that now. Every many to many relationship must have an owning side. And that is what belongs to defines. So in this case, we're saying that tag belongs to task. Therefore, task is the owner. With that done, we can restart the server. We now have a running web application. So we have scaffolded views for both tags and tasks. So we can create new tags. We can also see the information about the created ones. We can list them. We can also edit and delete. And then we can also create new tasks. We can't at this stage add any tags to this task. But once it's created, we can click on edit. And then we have the option of adding a couple of tags to it, like so. There are a couple of issues it would be nice to fix. First, we should show the names of tags when displaying a task. And we should also use a text area rather than a simple text field for the task description. Let's tackle those now. First, I want to stop the server because I'm going to be changing a domain class. Next, I go to the tag and override the toString method. And this will just return the name of the tag. Next, to deal with that uh, task description field, go to the task domain class. And for the details constraint, add a max size of 1,000. We can now restart the server to see what effect our changes have had. The server is up and running again, so let's recreate those tags and the task. See how this time the details field is a text area, which is much more appropriate for something that could contain a fair bit of text. This is a result of that max size constraint. You can also now see that the tag names are displayed. 
This is a result of overriding the toString method on the tag class. Now would be a good opportunity to see the effects of validation. As you can see, we can't create a task with an empty summary or an empty details because that is what we specified in the constraints. Neither of these could be blank. It's great that the Grail scaffolding does this validation for us, but those messages can certainly be improved. So, we go to the messages.properties file, and in here we have all the internationalization for the application. There are a lot of defaults, but now we want to add specific messages for the summary and the details. So, we create a key, which is the fully qualified name of the domain class, org.example.pomodoro.task, followed by the name of the field, dot summary, followed by the constraint that was violated, blank. And then on the right hand side we specify the text that we want to use for the error message. We can now try again to create an invalid task, and this time we see the new messages, as you can see, without a server restart. You may have noticed that when we restart the server, we lose any data that we created during the session. We can avoid having to manually recreate it by automatically creating it during server startup. We can do that through something called the bootstrap. This can be found in the Grails app slash conf directory. Saving new data is incredibly straightforward. You simply instantiate a new instance of a domain class, initialize its properties, and then use a special method called save. In these cases, I'm using passing a fail on error argument to the save method. And what this does is ensures that an exception is thrown if the domain instance doesn't validate. Initializing a domain instance's properties is a simple case of using named arguments in its constructor. So for example, we have new tag and then name, which is the name of one of it, the tag properties, colon, and then the value we want to initialize it to. Don't forget, if your domain class is in a package, you'll have to import it. Fortunately, STS can automatically import it for us. Saving a new task is very similar, but in this case we want to attach tags to this task. To do that, we use a method called addTo. Any time that a domain class has a collection property via hasMany, it gains add to and remove from methods. The exact method names are derived from the names of the collections. So task has a collection called tags, hence you get add to tags and remove from tags methods. Our bootstrap is now ready, so let's restart the server and see what happens. As you can see, our database is already populated with that sample task and the two tags. There's one last thing I want to discuss on scaffolding. Customization of the look and feel of the user interface. This can be done by installing the scaffolding templates using a special command and then modifying them. The command is simply install templates. The templates are now ready, but before I modify them, I just want to show you the files that we've been editing in the project tree. Here are the domain classes, and the controllers, and finally the bootstrap. Now back to the templates. These have been created in the src slash templates directory under scaffolding. And you'll see there's one for the controller, four for the views, and render editor dot template, which controls what HTML form elements are used for particular data types. That's all for this screencast. Next time, we'll start developing the custom user interface for our Pomodoro application.